Within a man-made breakwater of derelict ships on Canada's west coast lies a possible relic from a fascinating era in American history, the rip-roaring time known as Prohibition. Join the Sea Hunters as they seek the last resting place of the most famous smuggling ship on the west coast, the fabled Queen of the Rum Runners, Malahat. Prohibition was an era of gangsters, jazz, and bathtub gin. What started as a noble experiment soon became a multi-million dollar illegal industry controlled by well-run criminal gangs. Crime lords like Al Capone, Dutch Schultz, and Lucky Luciano ruled entire cities, buying off police and politicians and gunning down anyone else who got in their way. Small-time smugglers gave way to the huge syndicates dealing thousands of cases of liquor across the USA, much of it by sea. During the 13 years of Prohibition, one ship delivered more contraband than any other on Canada's west coast, the notorious schooner Malahat. The story of Malahat and her infamous career begins on Canada's west coast in Vancouver, British Columbia. The city of Vancouver was the home port of the rum-running Malahat and the headquarters of Canada's rum-runner fleet. The sea hunters have been asked to dive and identify a shipwreck, which some claim may be that of the fabled rum-runner. Yeah. Here at the Vancouver Maritime Museum, sea hunters Mike Fletcher, James Delgado and John Davis dive into the archives to learn more about the wreck. What intrigues the sea hunters is the uncertainty surrounding the location of Malahat's last resting place. Well, one of the really great mysteries about this search is, is that written history has the wreck as a derelict and as sinking here in Barclay Sound. Oral traditions tell us that she went down way over here in Powell River. What's the distance? 70 miles as the crow flies or 210 miles with a long, slow tow with a ship with a hole in her side and half full of water. Doesn't make sense. Why would you bring a derelict from here only to finish it off there? Well, that's the mystery. The history books can be wrong, and that's where archaeology steps in. I think we go there, we take a look, we dive it, we match it up archaeologically. We also do more work in the archives to see what we can find, and then hopefully pin the wreck on the chart. The team travels north up the coast to the small mill town of Powell River. Oral history casts doubt on the official version of Malahat's sinking in Barclay Sound. A local mill worker recalls a half-sunken derelict schooner towed to the mill pond in 1945, still containing its valuable cargo of logs. After the cargo was removed, it is thought the old schooner was scuttled nearby. Many people in Powell River believe that a wreck just off their coast is the schooner of the mill worker's account and, once examined, will prove to be none other than the Malahat. The temperance movement turned sobriety into a political issue. From pulpits across the land, alcohol was decried as a poison which destroyed health and decayed moral fiber. The USA's entrance into the First World War set the stage for the movement's political victory by effectively equating teetotalism with patriotism in the minds of the public and politicians, the movement turned the tide in Congress. At last, in 1919, Congress passed the 18th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, making prohibition the law of the land. North of the border, Canada had also imposed prohibition laws of its own. Shrewdly, however, Canada did not ban the manufacture of liquor for export. Canadian liquor could be purchased legally if it was for shipment to other nations, including the U.S. This left the door open for Canadian entrepreneurs. Canadian liquor companies, such as Seagram's, and businessmen such as Samuel Bronfman, took advantage of the law and its loopholes. Even with Canada's long, undefended border, one of the popular means to get liquor into the U.S. was by boat. These vessels, with their liquid cargo, became known as rum runners. On the East Coast, schooners and fishing vessels supplied the thirsty cities of New York and Boston. On the Great Lakes, steamships and lake vessels delivered to the gangs in Detroit and Chicago. 
On the West Coast, the liquor was warehoused and delivered to Southern California aboard large motherships. The most successful of these was the Malahat. Her vast holds, designed to carry huge loads of lumber, were filled with thousands of cases of liquor, sometimes 175 different brands. With this liquid cargo secure below, she would leave Vancouver for the waters of Rum Row off of Farallon Islands near San Francisco. There, just outside territorial limits, she operated as a deep sea liquor market. Before coming to Powell River, the Sea Hunters team reviewed plans of the Malahat to help them with their diagnosis of the wreck. The records paint Malahat as a sturdy working ship. She was a five-masted schooner, more than 74 meters or 245 feet long, and registered at 1,550 tons. She was built of British Columbian fur and rigged as a bald-headed schooner, so termed because she had no topsails. Dropping down on the site, you're immediately struck with the reality of just how badly deteriorated this shipwreck is. No doubt a result of the wood-consuming worms that are so common in salt water. We really had our work cut out for us. We had to go on a hunt for those tiny little details that would definitely identify this wreck as the Malahat. One of the first things that was obvious, and something that you were almost drawn to, were these struts that were holding a large bearing. I recognized immediately that this would have been the bearing that held a propeller shaft. And on further investigation, I could see there was two of them. We now knew with certainty we had a wooden ship that was powered by twin propellers. That was great evidence of Malahat. But could we find evidence that this wreck was also a sailing ship? That was our next step. One of the objectives of the dive is to determine the wreck's length. Records say the Malahat was 74 meters or 245 feet long. Well, Jacques laid out the tape measure to get an overall length of the site. I decided to swim towards what should have been the bow. I wanted to get a, a really good sense of just how the wreck lay on the bottom. And as I swam forward down that essentially the spine of the ship. I got the sense that I was an underwater paleontologist, and I was investigating the remains of an old dinosaur. And in effect, that's what we were doing. We were, we were trying to find those, those little bits amongst the broken bones that would resurrect this vessel as the Malahat. Traveling down what would have been the Kielsen, or the interior keel of the ship, I was really struck with just truly how large this vessel was. One of the more interesting three-dimensional components of the site were what we believed to be fuel tanks. Since we had really good drawings and measurements from Malahat, we realized that the tanks could in effect become a a signature that could only be matched to one ship. If we could measure the tanks and we could prove that they could fit theoretically below the decks of Malahat, then we had one more piece of mounting evidence. It's around 1923 and it looks really bad for sailing ships making a good living in the deep water trade. A lot of them are tied up in backwaters, they're no longer able to make their way in the deep water trade. Malahat, there she is, she's sitting in Seattle, it looks like her days are over. An enterprising gentleman named Archie McGillis, he looks at her and he says, you know, this, this is interesting, I think we got potential here because prohibition is still running strong in the States and we've just repealed it this year here in British Columbia. 
I think we can uh, make a go of it here. I mean, uh, we can provide a service here and make a, a, a good dollar at it. So what they did is they brought the, the, uh, the Malahat over to Vancouver, into Vancouver Harbor. They would pull her alongside a bonded warehouse in Vancouver Harbor, shift over 50 to 60,000 cases. And we're talking good quality liquor here. We're talking the best single malts from Scotland. We're talking brandies. We're talking about Portuguese port, everything. So what, what essentially they've created is a floating liquor emporium to take down to our thirsting neighbors down there in California that just love having a good time. As prohibition continued, the trade of illegal liquor flourished. In 1924, the Department of Commerce estimated that $40 million worth of illegal liquor was crossing the border into the U.S. Instead of purging demon rum from the land, prohibition had created an underground economy. On the west coast, the five-masted Malahat was doing her part to supply this economy. Each trip aboard the Malahat might last months. In the early days of the trade, she made two or three voyages a year. In the waning years, she would make one. While at sea, the Malahat would be resupplied by the smaller, faster boats of the Rum Runner fleet. The most dangerous time for rum running was when a small delivery boat, like a Speedy 750, so-called because of the number of cases they carried, tied up to the Malahat to pick up its prepaid order. This was when the Coast Guard would catch them in the act. With a second dive, the Sea Hunters team hopes to add to the archaeological data gathered during Mike's initial survey of the wreck. Dropping down to the wreck, it was clear that we were looking at a large wooden vessel that had been fitted with propellers. Measuring the strut which supported the propellers, I was struck by the fact that these were rather small. This was not a ship that depended upon the propeller as the central means of propulsion. The evidence suggested that we were looking at an auxiliary schooner, a ship that used engines only as an assist. Swimming along the side of the hull, we mapped and measured in the location of the chain plates. Chain plates are a big, flat strap of iron bolted to the side of a ship that support the stays or the rigging that holds a mast in place. The number of chain plates on the side of a hull tells you how many masts a ship had. And the way the chain plates are spaced one after the other shows you how many stays there were and what kind of lines connected to the mast. And that tells you what type of rig. Looking at the wreck on the bottom, we found five chain plates. And the way they were spaced indicated that we were on a schooner. Everything we saw on the bottom matched up exactly with what we knew about Malahat. The markups on contraband liquor were outrageous and the profits were staggering. Gang kingpin Al Capone netted $60 million from the liquor trade, the equivalent of $2 billion today. While Chicago stole the limelight with its gang's glamour and violence, the West Coast trade also proved very profitable and much more respectable. Now, you might get the impression that uh, this is kind of a swashbuckling adventures of the Caesar, you know, like, and maybe the mob's gonna get involved, maybe there's gonna be hijacking and piracy. But no, no, up here in Canada, prohibition's ended, it's all legitimate. You can establish yourself in a hotel and sell liquor, get a license and whatnot. So it was all above board. And some of the characters involved, remember, it was quite a stimulus to the economy in Vancouver Harbor. There was all these people employed on the waterfront. There was all the crews aboard all these different vessels. It was something like a fleet of 60 ships uh, by the mid-20s or late 20s, um, feeding this uh, market across the line. 
Over the 13 years of prohibition, the Malahat would deliver millions of bottles of liquor and earn the reputation on the West Coast as the Queen of the Rum Runners. When we're down on the bottom looking at a ship or a shipwreck, what we're doing is not just getting an impression, we're taking exact detailed measurements that we can then match up with a historical record. Measuring the tanks proved that they were exactly the right size for a motor vessel like Malahat. In fact, they matched identically. Documenting the ship meant not just measuring one set of features like the tanks, it meant moving along the entire length of the wreck, mapping, documenting each feature that we found. Bit by bit, piece by piece, we gathered the details that we need to come to a conclusion. The evidence that suggested this was Malahat boiled down to the fact that this wreck was a wooden auxiliary schooner as long as Malahat. And we could tell that from the length of the wreckage from the stern at the struts to the bow, where we found a hawse pipe where the anchor chain would have passed out of the hull. The chain plates would show that this had been a five-masted vessel, and the spacing of the chain plates that showed that the rig was that of a schooner. The other measurements showed how large the timbers had been, and these measurements, like those of the struts in the tanks, matched the surviving plans. All of this evidence, collected systematically and scientifically, gave us a real sense that if this wasn't Malahat, it was one of her sister ships. Unlike many of the vessels in the rum trade, the Malahat was never seized, never caught with contraband in territorial waters. Indeed, her crew actually developed a relationship, although an uneasy one, with the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard protected the schooner from hijackers, and in return, the occasional case of the good stuff would make its way back to the government cutter. Gradually, the market for smuggled liquor began to wane. It all came to an end in 1933 with the repeal of prohibition by Franklin Roosevelt. Breweries long idle were fired up and beer and liquors flowed once more. An eager public toasted the end of a noble experiment with legal glasses of their usual. The Malahat's reign was over. Eventually, she was sold to West Coast timber entrepreneurs as a logging ship. She continued her labors until 1944, when she was caught in a gale and pounded by the British Columbia logs held within her hold. Worn and tired, her working days were over, and she was reportedly abandoned. She went down in history as the queen of the rum runners. The question is, where does she lie? John, I think, you know, Shock and I have, you know, been conferring. There, it looks like Malahat. We've got a vessel that is of the, uh, the right length, right dimensions, right. obviously some sort of auxiliary-powered vessel. Uh, five chain plates, just five masts. Everything we're seeing on the bottom sure looks like one of those Mabel Brown-class Canadian-built motor sailing vessels right. from the First World War. This looks like Malahat. I just, there's nothing that has a name on it down there. Though, I mean, the only thing that will conclusively nail it is something in the archives. But if we don't find that, I still feel, you know, that's the map, somehow that's the Malahat sitting down there. So what's the next logical step? I think it's to dig in the archives. The Sea Hunters team is satisfied with the data they have added to the historical records of this wreck. But without some more conclusive evidence, the wreck will remain a mystery. Then, out of nowhere, and to everyone's great surprise, a long hidden clue unexpectedly emerges. It is perhaps the final piece of the puzzle. Finally, we get a call from a gentleman here in Paul River that's doing some work, looking in the old mill archives. And lo and behold, he contacts us. He says, I've been looking through some old filing cabinets, been gathering dust down in the basement, and I have this little clip here of telegrams mentioning this vessel called the Malahat. Do you, do you know anything about it? And I said, my God, do I know about it? I said, we've been looking for this for so long. And as it happens, here it is, like this, this telegram dated November 9, 1945. 
And it's to attention, Mr. D.A. Evans. Breakwater Hulk Malahat will be at Paul River 12.30 p.m. today. Captain has been advised to get tie-up instruction from Powell. Would you please pass this information on to scholar, signed George O'Brien. Here it is, the actual document that ties this mystery wreck in Powell River puts a name on the hull as the Malahat. I mean, that, that was just so satisfying when we finally received this. I mean, it just tied the whole story together. In underwater archeology, span you're always looking for a smoking gun to identify a ship, a bell, a nameplate, something that says, yes, this is it. Oftentimes, in the absence of that type of concise documentation, you're left with some element of doubt. You match everything up scientifically, bit by bit. Maybe it's the right size, the right shape, and in the right place, and all the pieces come together, and you feel, yes, this is it. But you never know for certain. In the case of the wreck at Powell River, though, the dives and the discovery of the telegram found in the basement archives clearly stated that Malahat had not come to an end at Barclay Sound, but had been brought around to Powell River where it had been sunk. That's all we needed. That was the smoking gun. That piece of paper put Malahat exactly at Powell River and showed us that the vessel on the bottom that had matched in every other circumstance was indeed Malahat, the queen of Rum Row. The history books were wrong, and thanks to archeology span and a fortunate discovery in the archives, we'd put the final piece of the puzzle together and had closed the book with new information that clearly said this was the end of the fabled Malahat. And so ends the mystery of the famous Malahat, a ship whose story reads like a pulp adventure novel. As a rum runner dodging the law and earning big money, the Malahat left behind a legend that will forever live along Canada's west coast. Hers is a tale of an era long past, of wooden ships, bathtub gin, and smugglers sailing into danger in the dark of night.